International Polar Year, which was completed in 2009, provided perhaps an opportunity of a lifetime to bring together the national Antarctic programs to participate in a new marine uh, uh, study of Antarctica. And during the IPY, uh, we were able to complete uh, 19 research voyages uh, to a number of regions of Antarctica, 300 scientists, 30 countries, and the Scientific Committee on Antarctic Research was the coordinating uh, institution or the body that allowed this to happen. We have, in the census, produced many uh, very valuable outcomes. Um, principally, we've been able to do this through the SCAR Marvin, SCAR's Marine Biodiversity Information Network. And I have to pay tribute here to the Belgian government that put over half a million euros into this data system to enable the census of Antarctic marine life to deliver its products to the world. During the study, during the whole uh, 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 run of CAMEL, we produced uh, many, many records, uh, well over a million records, uh, geo-referenced records in many different taxa, some of which you see here. And it has certainly enabled us to start to look at issues of uh, species richness and bioregionalization. What was perhaps unexpected uh, in some quarters was the richness of the marine environments uh, in various parts of Antarctica. Indeed, there was one paper that uh, made international uh, notice which compared the species richness of the Antarctic Peninsula with waters off the Galapagos Islands, uh, showing the species richness as being very similar. Our register of Antarctic marine species has 16,500 taxa, uh, accounting for 9,350 valid species names, and under our protocols, we had a, an international um, editorial committee that would validate each species. 76% um, of these taxa, the number is probably now a little, uh, a little higher, 76% of those taxa have been verified, and more are being added all the time uh, to uh, the Register of Antarctic Species. Uh, a little later, uh, we're going to hear uh, something about Cedamar, but Cedamar and Camel worked very closely together, particularly in, in the area of the, the, the deep sea, and Cedamar is a, a, a deep sea project. Uh, but um, uh, Andeep, the, the particular Cedamar project, uh, produced work which was listed amongst the top uh, the top 10 science results in 2011. Our colleague Angelica Brandt and her colleagues were those who conducted this work uh, and uh, she was awarded the SCAR Medal for Excellence in Antarctic Research in 2008. And some of the information coming out of that deep sea research is very, very interesting, as we'll see later. During the census, we found some uh, quite extraordinary uh, uh, examples of uh, fauna living on sea mounts, um, uh, archaic benthic assemblages is, is how they've been described. Um, the, uh, the information comes back of uh, an environment which looks like something out of the Permian or the Jurassic. Uh, and unfortunately, we're always aware that we've only had a tiny snapshot of what is available, one very small fragment of the total information which we should, which we can get from there. Here, Camel was working with our colleagues in Sensing, showing how when we bring our resources all together, we can produce some very, uh, very novel research. We've, we heard yesterday from uh, Eli Pullin about work on the collapsing uh, Larsen A and B ice shelves, work that was conducted by Julian Gut and his colleagues, um, and uh, uh, th these opportunities that are being presented to us by collapsing ice shells are ones that we should take uh, every time they come along. In fact, within the next month, 
or within the next two months, there'll be an Australian expedition going to the collapsing uh, Mertz Glacier, Mertz, uh, the, the Mertz Tongue Glacier in East Antarctica, and looking at a, a, a piece of sea floor which two years ago, when we were last there, we couldn't get near. We're going just in a few months now to see what the effect of the removal of the ice has been. We've been able to apply these new techniques in uh, 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 looking at evolutionary history to show that, for example, that deep sea octopus in many parts of the uh, far into the, the, the northern regions away from Antarctica have their origins in Antarctica. Linking together what Jesse and others have been speaking about today and, and, and over many months, linking together the physical phenomena with the biological phenomena. And for me, this is one of the greatest outcomes of the census of Antarctic marine life, has been that we've been able now to start to link together physical changes in our environment with biological changes in our environment. And those are the real challenges, of course, for us going forward into the future. This slide shows that we have collected a great many DNA sequences uh, of uh, Antarctic marine life, which are being fed into the uh, database of uh, the, the, the genetic databases and are becoming increasingly useful. We've been able to use our collected data to look at bioregionalization. And previously, uh, in the 1960s, the bioregionalization picture around Antarctica was very complex. But with the added data now, as you see here for chylostomes, cyclostomes, bivalves, pycnogonids, gastropods, and it will soon be uh, other groups, we've been able to show really that the whole of the Antarctic region is a single bioregion. And for wide-scale conservation analyses, and for the activities of the International Convention for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, these data are extremely valuable. And the, unifi the unifying feature is the Antarctic Circumpolar Current. Our work on the uh, pelagic areas with the uh, uh, continuous plankton recording is showing uh, not only seasonal variation, of course, as, as is uh, very apparent in the ice-filled Antarctic waters, but also we're, we're seeing a, a change in the paradigm. We're, saying, we're seeing a movement southwards of many species which previously were in the water at or around uh, 50 degrees south. They're now heading towards 60 degrees south. So we are seeing the effect of climate change through repeated biological sampling. And very particularly, we're seeing uh, changes in the Antarctic, on the Antarctic continent itself. Uh, the number of um, breeding penguins in rookeries at Palmer Station uh, over a, a, a number of years with the uh, Adelie and the Gentoo and the Chinstrap penguin, the numbers are changing from 1970 through to, to 2005. And you can see that the Gentoo penguin is now becoming uh, much more abundant uh, than the uh, Adelie penguin, which is very much fixated on ice. So we're seeing these changes just in a 20 or 30 year period, and we'll continue to see those changes. So the census then uh, of Antarctic marine life has created a number of legacies. We have field guides and, uh, and contributions to the Encyclopedia of Life, modern library of barcodes. We've collected historic records going back to the early 18th century. Uh, we've a 30-year time series of Admiralty Bay Benthos um, to be published soon in a special edition of Deep Sea Research. Uh, we have Antarctic vulnerable marine ecosystems that have been declared by Camelar, uh, two areas of about 4,000 uh, 4, square kilometres each off the Adelie Land coast. Uh, we've had enormous media coverage and we have uh, very successfully, I believe, built capacity in training uh, the next generation uh, of, of young scientists. But I think perhaps our most enduring uh, 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 legacy will be uh, the uh, creation of a Southern Ocean Observing System. And I want to just say a few words about what 
the Southern Ocean Observing System could look like. This particular legacy will be for a multidisciplinary observing system to deliver the sustained observations of the Southern, of the Southern Ocean needed to address key challenges, including climate change, sea level rise, and the impact of global change on marine ecosystems. If there is one thing that the last 10 or 20 years has shown us, it's the role of the Antarctic in driving the climate systems uh, of many parts of the world. The overturning circulation around Antarctica is crucially important for the fishing industry in Indonesia, for the fishing industry in Malaysia. Uh, it's crucially important to the long-term uh, maintenance of the oceanographic patterns uh, <coughs> into, the northern, into the northern hemisphere. So the southern ocean is, if any area, is crying out for sustained long-term observation. A Southern Ocean system, uh, which would cover the waters between the subtropical front and the Antarctic continent, would have to be based on six, uh, six fundamental uh, scientific questions, really. The role of the Southern Ocean in heat and water balance. We know that the Southern Ocean water, the deep water, is becoming fresher and warmer. Uh, and, and, and that is happening far faster than anybody thought, uh, even uh, uh, 20 years ago. And that brings into some degree of question the stability of the overturning circulation, where waters emerge from the depths in Antarctica to come to the surface and then to travel northwards again. And for the thermohaline pump uh, being caused by the freezing of water to make the ice and the um, and the high, re high density rejected water driving the circulation in the other direction. The stability of that Southern Ocean overturning circulation is a key to much of what we need to understand in terms of climate and biological communities. We need to know the role of the Southern Ocean in the stability of the Antarctic ice sheet, and that has significant consequences for sea level rise. Uh, the Antarctic ice sheet, now you will read in the newspapers that Antarctica is either warming or it's cooling. Well, we all know now not to believe what we read in the newspapers because the Antarctic is both warming and cooling. And in eastern Antarctica, where a lot of the census work has been performed, it is cooling. But in the west of Antarctica, it's warming. And uh, the, the effect of the uh, warming is very much like removing a cork from a bottle. If you take the sea ice away and you take the, 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 the mouth of the glacier away, then the speed of movement of the glacier increases. And that uh, is, is, is having a significant effect, particularly in West Antarctica on the Antarctic Peninsula. We need to know much more about the future and consequences of the Southern Ocean's ability to take up carbon. It already takes up about 40% of man-made carbon, human-made carbon. That, of course, has a very significant effect on the, uh, the lowering of the pH, the so-called ocean acidification. But the continued ability of the Southern Ocean to remove carbon from the atmosphere is a question that needs careful addressing. And uh, a Southern Ocean observing system would let us uh, begin to uh, obtain some of that sort of data. The future of Antarctic sea ice was one of the big unknown questions in the fourth assessment report of the IP, uh, IPCC. Uh, the Antarctic sea ice uh, is not suffering, not suffering yet the same fate as the Arctic sea ice, although there are areas in which there is a, a, a reduction in overall sea ice extent. That has significant effects on the biology of krill, and, and, and following from that, the biology of all of the species of animals that ultimately depend on krill, including, of course, the large whales. And finally, the impact of global change on Southern Ocean ecosystems. I've spoken about the southerly movement of plankton and about the displacement of Adelie penguins on continental Antarctica. Those elements of global change are affecting 
uh, the ecosystems uh, quite dramatically and quite substantially. So any Southern Ocean observing system must be sustained. We must be in this for the long haul. Not five years, not ten years, but we must have a vision of 50 years. It must be feasible and cost-effective. That is very difficult, of course. Uh, the cost-effectiveness is very difficult to, to determine in an area of the world where most observation ships and uh, other support can cost you $100,000 a day. It must be circumpolar from the subtropical front to Antarctica, and it must be multidisciplinary. It must be targeted to address specific challenges, and that itself is a challenge. We must decide what it is we're going to measure. It must be integrated with global ocean and climate observing, uh, observing systems, so it must be part of the Goose family. It must evolve with the, de with the development of new technology. And, and, and we're at a wonderful time in history to be able to make best use of these new, his, uh, these new technologies. We must have a well-established data management system, and we must deliver products which our users actually want. If our users want those products, sustainability is more guaranteed. And finally, it must be built on research programs that enables our funding agencies of our national Antarctic programs to continue their support. My university, through its new Institute for Marine and Antarctic Studies, has agreed to fund the Secretariat of ASUS, the International Project Office of SUS, for five years. And that office will be uh, housed within uh, the Integrated Marine Observing System, which is an Australian federally funded network of marine observing nodes, and uh, Ron was speaking just a little bit about that a few minutes ago. So we've got the architecture in which we can house a Southern Ocean observing system, and there will be an international network, uh, international workshop in the middle of next year to establish the parameters. We have to decide what we want to study because we can't study everything. We have to decide what we want to study and how we're going to do it and how we're going to integrate the uh, logistics which is necessary uh, to give us sustained observing. So SUS will be a lasting legacy of the census of marine life and particularly the census of Antarctic marine life. And what it will do will be to link physical and biological observations in a part of the world, and I think this is important now, a part of the world where data sharing and research cooperation is mandated by the provisions of the Antarctic Treaty. That's a very, very important step. In the Antarctic, we have been collaborating forever. We, we're always collaborating and we're always sharing data. Article 3 of the Antarctic Treaty requires us to share data in a timely manner. It's up to each of us as Antarctic nations to decide what we mean by timely. Australia reckons that a researcher can have their data for two years and then it must be available internationally. So we've already got that fundamental sense of goodwill and, 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 and a sense of being able to cooperate. We must build on that and I believe that uh, if we do build on it in the right way and with the right, uh, with the, uh, the right spirit, then this long-lasting legacy of the census of Antarctic marine life will be around for another many, many decades to come. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Michael. Uh, we have one minute for questions. Thank you very much for such a great presentation. I'm Chilean. I work in the south of Chile with fishermen. Was wondering what are what do you have you anticipated any private sector involvement implications from uh, your results? Uh, for, from the SOS? Thank you for that question. It's a very good one because it, 
touches on a, a key element about ongoing sustained observing systems where the products that you produce must be useful for end users. And, and, and if industry is an end user, then provided the requirements of industry conform with the requirements of the Antarctic Treaty, which is from 60 degrees south, not, not the, the more northerly region, provided that uh, a commercial use is consistent with the requirements of the Antarctic Treaty, then uh, the involvement of uh, private industry and commerce would be welcomed. Uh, the private industry and commerce have long-term objectives, but they also have short-term requirements. And I believe that uh, a good observing system can can very usefully accommodate both of those requirements. So, yes, it would be welcomed. Thank you. I think uh, we have no more time for questions. Thank you very much, Michael.